the year was 2011. Yep, that's me. <laughs> I was a chubby, carefree year four student navigating my way through primary school life. Like most primary school students, I used to set up to school every day with the essentials. A packed lunch, a school bag, a hat, a pencil case, and of course, an enormous sack filled to the brim with 64 beanie kids. Now, these beanie kids were my most prized possessions. My favorites were Ringo the Possum, Midnight the Bear, and Stinky the Skunk. If I had more time, I could name every single one of them and describe their personalities in great descriptive detail. But alas, we'd be here all night. Now, I'd haul this sack out to the playground every recess and lunchtime and invent magical stories with them. Stories of adventure, love, loss, lust, and regret. Now, this wasn't just a one-man show. There was one other student in the entire school who shared my passion for Beanie Kids. Olivia, if you're watching, hi. So that was how it was then. I was happy with life and completely oblivious to what was going on around me. But year four was soon over, and my time at a new school, Vera Grammar, began. Like most kids starting in a new school, I was pretty nervous for my first day, but was comforted by the fact that my beanie kids would be there with me. Unfortunately, on that first morning, my mum broke to me some devastating news. Matthew, she said, at Berwick Grammar, Beanie Kids are banned. I was pretty upset at the time, but nevertheless, I accepted my school's oddly specific rule and quickly moved on, thriving in my new environment. It was only years later that I discovered that no such rule actually existed. It was a fabrication that my parents had created because in their eyes, showing up on day one at an all-boys school with a sack of beanie kids would have been the equivalent of running naked into a pack of hungry dogs while wearing nothing but a sausage necklace. To be honest, every day I thank my parents for their shameless lie. For although I hadn't realized it at the time, I'd actually been the subject of some pretty nasty bullying from various students, both boys and girls. Having heard that, some of you might applaud my parents' decision to not let me take those beanie kids to my first day. But if so, I challenge you to ask yourself, why? Now, obviously, my parents were trying to protect me. But the real question is, why did they have to? After all, I wasn't hurting anyone. I wasn't breaking any rules. I was just minding my own business. No matter how much time I spent thinking about it, I always come to the same conclusion. I was picked on simply because what I was doing wasn't perceived as normal by my peers and teachers, but by my parents as well. Because most boys don't play with beanie kids, right? Because most boys' friends are other boys. Because most boys play football and cricket. And what if they don't? Well, any guy here have been called a girl, wuss, gay? made to feel different or excluded because they didn't conform to a stereotype or meet certain criteria. My story illustrates what has been and still is one of the biggest questions that society needs to address. What is a real man? To illustrate what I'm talking about, let's take a look at the man box, a recent study conducted with young Australian men. The man box is a set of beliefs within and across society which place pressure on men to be a certain way, to be tough, to not show any emotions, to be the breadwinner, to always be in control, to use violence to solve problems, and to have many sexual partners. Outside the box are terms commonly used to insult men who don't live up to these so-called manly expectations, including some of the insults that I mentioned before. And after interviewing and surveying young Australian men, they found that the majority of young men agree that there are pressures on them to act or behave a certain way based solely on their gender. This is evidence of what I see as a damaging dichotomy between expectations and reality. 
After all, the concept of being a real man isn't something new. It's instilled in our vernacular from every boy's early years. But the fact is, there are rigid constructs that force men to be a certain way. And these perceptions come from both men and women. If I asked you right now to picture in your head what a real man looks like, what do you see? Do you see a kind, caring, respectful person? Someone who believes in gender equality, gay rights, and peace resolution to conflict? Or maybe you see a good-looking, physically fit individual, a decision maker who acts tough and hides their weaknesses, someone who always gets their way and doesn't care what anyone else thinks. Now, you might not believe that this latter image actually represents what a real man is supposed to be. It is, after all, stereotypical and traditional. But as the man box study shows, that's not what young men are thinking. They might be thinking that this unattainable image of what a real man is supposed to be is what is wanted from them, if not expected. But at this point, you might be wondering, why does this even matter? So what if men are a little confused about their identities? Big deal. It's not like they're suffering much, right? In fact, last I checked, men are outperforming women in just about every category. Take a look at this graph comparing the average wages of men and women worldwide. Men are dominating in this area, and as you can see, this trend follows them from the moment they start work to the moment they finish. How about this graph? Another category that men are winning in. But let's play a game. What do you think this graph represents? Is it the number of men versus women in politics? No. Is it the number of men versus women holding executive positions? No. Maybe it's comparing the average prize money between male and female athletes. No. Although it could be any of those things, what this graph actually represents is male suicide rates in Australia. Not exactly something we want a gold medal for. Here are some more alarming facts. Guess who is more likely to commit murder? Men. Guess who is more likely to be a victim of murder? Men. Guess who's more likely to perpetrate domestic violence? Men. Guess who's more likely to die in a motor vehicle accident? Men. And guess who has a lower average lifespan compared to the opposite sex in every single country worldwide? That's right. It's men. So the thing is, men actually aren't doing very well at all. The Black Dog Institute claims that there are six key qualities that are found in mentally healthy individuals. And those are supportive social relationships, a sense of control, a sense of purpose, family harmony, effective help seeking, and access to quality health services. Mentally healthy people don't kill themselves or beat their partners. So to me, it's pretty obvious. Men must be lacking in some, if not all, of these categories. The two that stand out the most for me are men feeling out of control combined with their inability to seek help. Men's mental health issues derive from a feeling of being out of control in that they feel pressure to conform to traditional masculinity, which, generally speaking, they don't all embrace or aspire to. And what do most men do when they're struggling? Nothing. Did you know that while men are three times more likely to take their own lives, women are three times more likely to seek help? It's not too dramatic to call this a crisis. Men are in crisis. And we've all seen what impact this can have on all members of our society. As a young man growing up, I very much felt the kind of pressure that I've been talking about today. There have been times when I should have spoken to someone, but didn't. There have been times I've said or done things just to be one of the boys, even though I didn't believe in them. Are we making progress? Yes, to some degree. There's been more focus on men's health in the past few years than ever before. But the fact is, gender roles in our society are still rigidly defined and vigilantly enforced. At the very least, the conversation needs to change from what is a real man to what it takes to be a good man. And positive things are happening in this space. The Good Men Project, the White Room Campaign, and XY Online are just a few examples. But we need to do more. It'd be fair to say that not everyone knows about these initiatives, let alone are engaged in these programs. 
We need something that is consistent, coordinated, and universal if we are to build awareness, understanding, and skills to support our young men. For this reason, I believe the best place to start is in our schools. What we need is a compulsory curriculum if we are to engage young men and create a meaningful dialogue. I see my personal contribution to this cause in the immediate future as continuing to raise awareness and just being a good role model. In the longer term, I have aspirations to move into psychology with a focus on men's mental health. I want to be part of the process of reinforcing positive, equitable, unrestrictive ideas of manhood. I want to help our young men understand that they don't need to feel confined to a box or that they have to live up to anyone's expectations other than their own and that it's far more important to be a good man rather than a real man. So on behalf of Ringo, Midnight, Stinky, and all of my Beanie Kids, thank you. <laughs>